Can you hear me? So I'm pleased to be with you today. I wish I could be present there in Ibadan. You know, Ibadan is my home city in Nigeria. And uh, we're just grateful that we can be together with you by, by Zoom. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ gathered together for one purpose, and that is for his will and for his glory. <clears throat> Although I'm not in Nigeria with you today, um, I'm seated at my, at my table where we eat. So I'm not going to preach to you today. I want us to sit around this table together. So imagine that you are with me. Tunde's over here, Bio's over there, Fumi's over there, and we're sitting around the table. We're gonna talk about important things. Are you hearing me, Stephen? Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> We we moved to Nigeria in 1982 with my wife and children. We lived along New Ife Road in Ibadan in an ordinary flat. We only brought with us the things that we could carry on the airplane. Our furniture was things borrowed from Christians in Nigeria. <clears throat> We didn't have a car. <clears throat> if we had to get food, we would enter one of those buses that are supposed to have eight people, but have 15. And we, I would go to Duke Bay Market. I would shout with the people there, bargain <laughs> to buy the food that we needed to buy. And then I would carry it back to my house. I learned to love yam, <laughs> cassava, a goosey soup, all of the things that you eat, we ate. <clears throat> My wife gave birth to our third child in Nigeria, and she was given the name Oluag Bebemi by my Nigerian brothers. So I know Nigeria. I love Nigeria. I know what it is to be without Nepa for three days at a time. We, we know how to live as you live. When I lived in our flat in Ibadan, we didn't have water. We had to carry water. How many of you know what it's like to carry water? <laughs> well, we carried water. We, we learned how to use kerosene for light. But God was faithful. And he kept us through that time. And I believe that he gave us a prophetic vision that he fulfilled for his glory. The vision God gave us came from the book of Isaiah. And it said that, <clears throat> that we should stretch forth the curtains of our habitation, lengthen it our cords strengthen our stakes that that we would break forth on the right hand and on the left and that our seed would inherit the Gentiles and cause the desolate cities to be inhabited. God gave us a vision that you in Nigeria would be a seed that God would use to impact the nations. And I believe that that is the task that God has set before the church in Nigeria. And so it's something that you should embrace and keep ever in your mind. You know, the conditions in Nigeria now are difficult. You know that. But remember, they are less difficult than they were in Jerusalem 
when the gospel was launched on the day of Pentecost, everybody was against the followers of Jesus. The Jews had killed Jesus. They wanted to kill Jesus' disciples. The Roman government hated Christians. The pagan cities were idol worshipers, and they despised those new believers who turned away from their religion. <clears throat> so whatever circumstances we are in today, they are not more difficult than those that Jesus' first disciples faced. So I want us to take heart. I want us to come together for this time and look to God to do amazing things for his glory. Let's begin by prayer, shall we? Join me as we pray. Father, we come in the name of Jesus. Lord, we are nobody apart from you. We have no power, no ability. Nothing that we say matters unless you are in it. So God, we want to invite you and your Holy Spirit to be among us today. Lord, that your word would penetrate our hearts, that we would hear your voice, and that we would respond to what you're saying to us. Lord, we know that you have called us to something great, but we have no ability of ourselves. Our sufficiency is of God and of God alone. So God, we are inviting you to fill us with your Holy Spirit today, to speak to us, Lord, to transform us, that you would be glorified and that your word would go forth in Jesus' name. Pray. Amen. Well, Stephen Alamu, who's with you today, has challenged me to write. And so I tried. And later, you should receive a book about what we're talking about these two days. I want us to have a conversation today about big things. And before we begin, a couple of things are really important. Number one, whatever I say here does not matter unless you take these things to the Lord. In... <clears throat> In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, and I hope you have your Bibles today, and I hope you have something to write with that maybe you will want to write some of these scriptures down. It says, Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophesying, but prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. Basically, God is saying to you, don't believe what Jack says. Test everything that I say and that you hear during this conference with the word of God. That is your responsibility. You need to know what God says. If you are going by the word of the conference speakers, that has no power. The power is in the word of God. So after this conference, or, or as you go through this time, test everything you hear. Is it consistent with the Word of God? The second thing I want to say is that we'll ask a question. Why does God speak to us? Why does he reveal his truth to us? Well, there are two reasons. One is he wants his word to have an impact in each of our lives. If we hear God's word and it doesn't change us, then it has no impact. We might as well not even have come to the conference. So God wants you to be changed by his word. Secondly, he wants you to take that which he has opened to you by his Holy Spirit, and he wants you to give it to other people. So everything that you have, when you receive it, when you put it into practice in your own life, then you're required to pass that on to other people. 
So we're going to talk about some big questions. The first one is, and if I was there with you, and if we're sitting around the table, I would ask you to answer this question. The question is, what is God's purpose right now in Nigeria, in your life? What does he want? What is his purpose? And you would have some answers like, well, he wants to uh, us to know him and make him known. How many of you have heard that before? <laughs> to know God and make him known. <laughs> well, that's true. And there are many good answers to that question. But let's make it very simple. God wants to be made known through you. He wants his message to be lived out through you. <clears throat> Jesus gave a new commandment to his disciples. He said, by this will all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. That's John 13, 34, and 35. So Jesus said that everyone in the world would know that you were my disciples if you had love for one another. So God wants a demonstrated love, a love that the world can see to be going on in your life and my life. And I promise you that when that love is flowing between God's people, the world will see it. Secondly, in John 17, Jesus prayed this from verse 21 through 23. I want to read that. John 17, 21 through 23. Jesus' prayer of intercession for his disciples, and he included us in that prayer. He said that he was praying not only for the 12, but for the, all those that would believe on him through their word. And if you are a believer today, you are a believer because you believed on him through their word. Amen. And so this is his prayer that they all may be one. As thou father art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that you have sent me. How is the world going to believe that God sent Jesus into the world? Well, according to Jesus, it's when you and I and all of us are united, when we are one in heart and mind. And the glory which you gave me, I have given to them that they may be one, just as we are one. How close do you think Jesus is with the Father? How united is Jesus with the Father? Is that not perfect unity? And he's yes. saying, I have given my glory to them in order that they might be one, just as we are one. And the world may know that you have sent me and has loved them as you have loved me. How is the world going to know that God loves them? Well, Jesus says right here, he's going, the world's going to know that by our unity. That's very powerful. <clears throat> so what happened? Let's, let's look for a little bit of time. At what happened with the early believers, with those first believers? First of all, Jesus gave them a commission. You know what it is. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. He said, you receive power. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> he said, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, teaching them to do to observe everything that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. This was Jesus' commission to every one of us. What is it? Make disciples. Pretty simple, right? And then 
just before his ascension in Acts chapter 1-8, he said, you receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you will be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, can you imagine those disciples sitting there listening to Jesus and they're saying the uttermost parts of the earth, we've never even been beyond Galilee. <laughs> These were simple men. They were fishermen and laborers. One of them was a tax collector. They didn't know anything about the ends of the earth. And yet Jesus said, you will be witnesses to me unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So he told them to wait in Jerusalem. So they did. They, they waited in the upper room. You can read the story in Acts chapter 1. It says that they gave themselves to prayer for 10 days. They had a 10-day prayer meeting. And then it says that they were all of one accord. Do you see the word there? They were in unity. Are, are, we, are we understanding this? The yes. unity that Jesus talked about, they were experiencing in that upper room. I want us to note something. Unity is the atmosphere of the Holy Spirit. I really wish you would write that down and remember it. Unity is the atmosphere of the Holy Spirit. When we are divided, the Holy Spirit cannot work. Because division is always a symptom of pride and sin and self. Unity is the environment of the Holy Spirit. And they were all of one heart and of one mind. And when the day of Pentecost came, the Holy Spirit was poured out. You know the story, Acts chapter 2. And that day, this fisherman who never seemed to get anything right, Peter, stood up and he preached a sermon under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And what happened? 3,000 people came to Jesus Christ through repentance and faith. And they were baptized the same day. Are we following? So 120 people suddenly became 3,000. And then a few days later, another 5,000 people were added when the lame man who sat at the beautiful, beautiful gate was, say, was healed and the message was preached again. Now, who were these people? The Bible tells us that they were from 13 different nations. They spoke different languages. And on the day of Pentecost, they heard their, the gospel spoken in their own language. These were people who had come to Jerusalem for a once-in-a-lifetime experience of Passover to Pentecost. They had probably saved money all of their lives so that they could come and spend one time in Jerusalem and experience the highlights of the Jewish faith. And then... Suddenly, everything changed. They had become new creatures in Christ. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they were wondering, what should we do? Remember, what did Jesus tell his disciples to do? He didn't tell them make converts. He said, make disciples. Are we un understanding? I, I hope you get my English okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, so he told them to make disciples. Well, that is a process. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us this specifically, but we know that these people stayed in Jerusalem after Pentecost. Because when persecution broke out about three years later, they went back to where they came from. And <clears throat> so we see the story. 
that they were there in Jerusalem now, 8,000 believers plus, and what do you think was happening? Well, if we look in Acts chapter 2, and I hope you'll read this later, it says that after they were baptized, it says that they continued steadfastly. This is verse 42. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' teachings and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. They continued daily with one accord. You see the unity there? They continued daily with one accord. There was unity. In the temple, breaking bread from house to house, praising God, and God continued to add to the people. <clears throat> so these new believers were being taught every day. They were, they were being discipled. They were being equipped to do what? To go out and make more disciples. <clears throat> God's plan has always been that we would be not just believers, but that we would be disciples. That is, followers of Jesus. We'll talk more about that later. <clears throat> In Acts chapter 11, we see that persecution had broken out on the church in Jerusalem <clears throat> after Stephen had been stoned. And <clears throat> and what happened was that they um the, the believers that were in <clears throat> Jerusalem went as far as Antioch, it says, preaching the gospel. And a great number of people believed. <clears throat> this is Acts eleven nineteen. Now, do you know where Antioch is from Jerusalem? Antioch is more than 700 kilometers from Jerusalem. <clears throat> These were people who had, had come for the feast days, had, be, had been converted, and had been discipled for probably about three years. And they went back to Antioch, and it says a great number of people believed. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned to the Lord. <clears throat> now, who were these people who went to Antioch? Well, they weren't any of the 12. They weren't anybody special. They were ordinary disciples who had been trained to make disciples in Jerusalem. And they took that job seriously. So when they went back to Antioch, the first thing they did is they told everybody what God had done and people began to turn to the Lord. So the gospel began to spread, and it went rapidly, it began to, to fill the whole Roman Empire. And so uh, just to summarize, in the 50 years after Pentecost, the gospel spread to the whole Roman Empire. At one point, and I'd like to read this, Paul was writing to the church in Thessalonica. And he, uh, he told them, you know, I came to Thessalonica and I preached. And people were saved. <clears throat> and in verse 6, it says, You became followers of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. Having received the word in much affliction, with joy in the Holy Ghost, so that you became examples to all that believed in Macedonia 
and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but to every place, your faith toward God is spread abroad so that we need not to say anything. Now, do you know what, what Macedonia and Achaia were? They were two provinces in Rome. This is an area about the size of Nigeria between the Niger River and West. I think it comprises about 10 or 12 states in Nigeria. All right? Are you following me here? So one church in Thessalonica was such a witness of the Lord. Paul says, we don't need to go to those two provinces. You are there. You are doing this work. We're going to go to a new place. I think that's amazing. To give you an idea, let's say you live in Akiti. Did anybody live in Akiti? No? <laughs> anybody live in Ibadan? <laughs> well, let's say you live there and you were a fellowship, a, a church in Akiti or Ibadan. And, and you said, okay, we are going to take all of Eastern Nigeria. We will make sure that that part of the world is covered with the gospel. Paul, you go on to uh, uh, where? Niger, <laughs> uh, Togo, Benin Republic. You go on to those places. We will cover Eastern Nigeria. This was the mindset of the early church do you see how the gospel spread every believer a disciple and every believer a disciple maker you came into the kingdom of god so that god could use you to grow the kingdom of god this was the atmosphere of the early church i hope you see this it was so powerful. They were doing what Jesus said to do. Now, I want to give you some characteristics of that early church. We know that it was God's program, and I still believe that it is, is to make him known. And the way we make him known is not only by what we say, but it's by what we are. In fact, I think that what we are is more important than what we know. In other words, if you can preach a really good message, but you don't love and you're not united, your message has no power. But if we are people who love one another with the love of Christ and are united by the means of the Holy Spirit, then the message we speak has power. Do we all understand that? Yes, That's so important. So we, as Jesus' disciples, are to demonstrate to a lost world what God is like by what we are. Our demonstration is our lives. And apart from our lives, our words have very little power. <clears throat> so this is God's goal, and this is what he's seeking to do. So we see how the church grew dramatically during the first 50 years. Let's look at a few characteristics of that church. In Matthew 20, Jesus set out a very important principle. And I uh, hope you will read this story later. From 20 to 28, Matthew 20 from 20 to 28. <clears throat> Jesus is there with his disciples. And the mother of James and John comes to Jesus and he says, she says to him, Jesus, 
I want to ask you a favor. He said, okay, what is it? I want, when you set up your kingdom, I want you to put James and John, one on your right hand, one on your left. I want them to be right beside you in your kingdom. Number two, maybe number two and three. <laughs> well, when the other disciples heard this, they were angry. <laughs> you, you got your mother to go and ask Jesus for this? That's terrible. And so they were, they were angry with the, with the two disciples. Now, this is what Jesus said. Verse 25. He called the disciples to him and he said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them. And those that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. Let him... But whoever will be great among you, let him be your minister or your servant. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to, to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Beloved, this is, this is Jesus telling us this is how we're to live. We are to live as servants, as slaves of one another. We are not to be exalted. We're not to be put up on a pedestal. Do you think that Peter and John and the other apostles and Paul were on a pedestal? <laughs> no. They suffered more than anybody. They didn't, they didn't ride into town in a chariot with horses running in front of them. They walked. <laughs> you know, they were... They were meek and lowly like their Lord Jesus was. Now, why did God have Jesus born in a stable? Why did he have him born in a poor family? Why did he have him grow up working with his hands until he was 30 years of age? The Bible says that he was meek and lowly. Wasn't exalted in the sight of men. But God exalted him. Jesus' path was downward, and God exalted him. Saints, it's so important that we understand that to be great in God's kingdom, we have to become a servant. We have to put the towel on our waist, as Jesus did, and wash one another's feet. Not literally, but, but in you can even do that, literally. But in our mindset, we need to be a... Do you know who it was that washed feet in a, in a household? If you were a rich man <clears throat> or woman, and you had servants in your household, the higher-up servants would serve the food and do the nice work. The lowest servant was the one who had to wash the feet of your guests when they came in the house. That's what Jesus did. And he said to his disciples, you saw what I did. You need to do what I've done. So Jesus set a tone for the early church was a tone of humility and servitude. I hope we see that. Yes, <clears throat> I want us to look to at um, Psalm, I mean, sorry, Matthew 23. And in your notes, if you want to write this down, read, write down verses 1 through 12. <clears throat> we won't read them all. Jesus was talking about the scribes and Pharisees. He said, you should respect them. And I think this is important. We need to respect people regardless of whether we agree with them or not. Jesus respected those in authority even when he disagreed with them. And he taught his disciples to do that. But he said, they do what they do to be seen of men. And they love to be placed high among people. Then verse 8, he says, don't be like those people. 
Don't be called rabbi. For one is your master, even Christ. And all of you are what? Are you reading this? All of you are brothers and sisters. <laughs> There's no lords in the body of Christ except the Lord Jesus. Amen. There are no G.O.s in the body of Christ. Jesus is the G.O. Are you with me? Yes, there is no Lord apart from the Lord Jesus. So he said to them, you are all brothers. And call no man your father. Now, I know it's a custom in Nigeria to say... Daddy. <laughs> and some people call me that. You know, I don't mind, but I, I don't like it. <laughs> because if I'm a daddy, then what are you? <laughs> so <clears throat> we are all to be brothers and sisters. <clears throat> Call no man your father, for one is your father in heaven. Neither be called masters. For one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever will exalt himself shall be brought low. And he, shall, and he that shall humble himself will be exalted. Jesus taught his disciples not to use titles. If you look through the New Testament, you will never see one time when a title is used, even with the 12 disciples of Jesus. Paul did not even use the title of apostle. He didn't call himself the apostle Paul. He said, Paul, apostle and apostle of Jesus Christ. And you know what that means? It means Paul, someone who was sent by Jesus. That's all. It's not a title. It's a job description. So if uh, if uh, if somebody in the in the room today is named Bio and Bio is a carpenter and he could be introduced as Bio the carpenter that would not exalt him it would be a description of the Bio we're talking about <laughs> I hope we understand this but what have we done we have used titles. I, yes. I go to Nigeria, and there are people who have four titles before their name. The most reverend, apostle, prophet, yes. bishop, so-and-so. <clears throat> and if you don't use the titles, they don't love you. <clears throat> I want to read a passage in Psalm 111. If you... I think this is so important. I, I don't want to criticize people, but I want us to demonstrate these truths in our lives. Psalm 111, verse 9. <clears throat> this is the only time in the Bible the word reverend is used. All right? You can check it out. There's one time in the whole Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, when the Bible, when the Bible uses the word reverend, and it's in Psalm 111, verse 9. <clears throat> I'll read it. <clears throat> he sent redemption to his people. He commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverent is his name. Who are we talking about here? Well, who sent redemption to his people? It wasn't Stephen Alamu. Oh. <laughs> it wasn't Jack Ring. It was the Lord God, the creator of heaven and earth. And his name and his name alone is reverent. Holy and reverent is his name. Now, I don't know about you, but I have, I have been to Nigeria and, and people put up, uh, you know, those announcements that this person is coming to speak. And sometimes I have seen Reverend Jack Ring, I say, please take that down. Don't put Reverend in front of my name. 
<laughs> the only one who's reverend is God. <clears throat> well, why does this matter? The early church was powerful because there were no lords but the Lord Jesus. If you're reverend and I am not, then I'm going to let you do the work and I'm going to watch you do it. Are you following me? If you are exalted as somebody, and I am not, I'm just one of the people, then I'm going to let you do everything, and I will just sit there and listen. That was not God's plan. God's plan was that every one of us be ambassadors for Christ. Every one of us be disciple makers. So we see the importance of the pattern that Jesus gave. I, I have so many other scriptures I wish we could look at, but I'm trying to use our time well. <laughs> now, if I were preaching in America right now, we would be done with the service because you don't dare go beyond 30 minutes or people get bored. I hope you're not getting bored. So just one more passage. In John 12, 23 through 25, <clears throat> Jesus said, except a corn of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it brings forth what? Much. Much fruit. So if you're a seed, if you sit that seed on the shelf and say, oh, what a beautiful seed. I love that seed. It's a perfect seed. But that seed sitting on the shelf is of no value. You are designed by God to be planted. And to be planted means you have to go into the ground and die to yourself. I'm not talking about physical death. We're talking about death to self. And you die to yourself in order that you can bring forth fruit. Someone who has not died to self will not be fruitful. <clears throat> if you want to read some scriptures later, the apostles were called last of all. They have the first and most prominent ministry, but they're called last. Paul in 1 Corinthians 4 names all of the terrible things that are happening to him as an apostle. How he's being persecuted and beaten and thrown in prison and he's hungry and he's fasting and, you know... He's going through terribly difficult things for the sake of the gospel of Jesus. He says at the end, he's a spectacle to all men and the offscouring of the earth. Do you know what an offscouring is? An offscouring is like this. You know when you cook some food in your, in your pot and it's late at night, and something has burned on the bottom of the pot, you know? <laughs> and you, you, you take the good part out and you leave that burned part in the pot. And then the next morning, you have to clean the pot. That's the offscouring. That's what's left in the bottom of the pot. It's that filthy, dirty thing you have to clean up. It's called offscouring. Paul said, that's what we are to the world. I hope you get this. Yes. So apostles who are the primary or the first ministry that's named are considered by the world to be off scouring. God's requirement for ministry is humility. <clears throat> now, I want to see something else now. What do you think is the, here's a big question. What do you think is the primary 
objective of Satan and his realm right now. Right now, today, as you're sitting there in Ibadan, Nigeria, what is Satan's goal for you? What does he want to do? I think it's, an, it's, I think it's a very important question. <clears throat> Satan was not prepared for what happened on the day of Pentecost. He had never seen a group of people filled with the Holy Spirit, united and so powerful. He had no power against that early church. And I believe that there was a council in hell or wherever his realm is. And all the chief demons got together with Lucifer. And they said, what are we going to do to stop these people? So what do you think Satan's objective is? Do you think that Satan believes the Bible? Yes. What do you think? Yes. Does he believe the Bible? Yes. Now, he doesn't believe the Bible with saving faith, but Satan knows the Bible backwards to forwards in every language that's ever been written. He knows the he knows the Bible in languages you've never heard of, and he knows every word from memory. And he believes it's true, but he does not believe with saving faith, but he believes that it's true. And Satan has read Revelation 20, verse 10, where he and all of his angels end up in the lake of fire. Are you with me? Yes, Satan knows beyond any doubt. He is 100% sure. He believes this more than you do. He knows that he's going to be in the lake of fire. Eternally. And that is a great motivator. So I believe that Satan's goal is simple. Let's look at one more verse of scripture that Satan believes. Matthew 24, 14. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Now, we have this question, when is the end going to come? Everybody wants to know that. And I can tell you exactly when the end is coming. Because Jesus told us. He didn't give us a date, but he told us. He said in Matthew 24, 14, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then what? Then the end will come. So when is the end going to come? When every ethnic group on earth has had a chance to hear the gospel. It doesn't mean they're saved, but they have heard the message. And when that happens, the end will come. So what do you think Satan's goal is? To prevent it. To prevent it. His goal is to delay the end. He knows the end is coming, and he cannot prevent it from coming, but he's He's going to delay it for as long as he can. And he's been doing it now for how long? 2,000 years. So he had a strategy. He knew that the strength of the church was in their unity and love. Are you hearing me? Yes, he knew that the strength of the church was in their unity and love. So his plan is, how can I break that unity and how can I break that love so that the world will not be impacted by the gospel? It's very simple. And that has been his strategy. I want to tell you this. <clears throat> Satan knows that God's only instrument for spreading the gospel and multiplying disciple is 
his redeemed people, that is you sitting right there today. You are God's only instrument for spreading the gospel. We are his only target. He doesn't really care how often you go to church or even to conferences. You could go to every conference that Stephen plans, you know, and everybody else plans. You could go to church four times a week. You could go to a prayer meeting. He doesn't care. You can dance and sing and shout inside this building you're in right now. You could do that. He doesn't care. Doesn't bother him at all. He's not too concerned. Even if you have a big mega church that's built over here and it fills up with people, as long as they stay inside that building, he doesn't care. He doesn't really care that much if there's a big crusade. Because he knows that whoever comes forward and makes decisions, only 5% of them are going to be in church a year from now. Do you know that? He knows that. And he knows that the people who are, are going to be in the mega church and they're just going to be sitting there listening. They are not a threat to his kingdom. He is not afraid of that. What worries Satan and his demons the most is that one follower of Jesus, one of you, will understand that your job in life is to be a disciple and make disciples. And that you will go out from this conference and you will start being a witness for Christ. And when somebody comes to faith in Jesus, you will baptize them. Yes, you can do that. <laughs> Even you ladies can do that. There's nothing in the Bible that says you can't. <laughs> you will baptize them. You will train them to be disciples. You will train them to be disciple makers. And that frightens Satan. That's when they go to war against you. As long as you're sitting there, you can believe everything that's said at this conference. But if you don't act on it, then you are not a threat to the kingdom of darkness. I hope you hear me. I hope you hear the Lord. Yes. But if you go out from this conference and begin to make disciples, and then you train them to be disciple makers, oh, then the demonic world is going to fight you. Expect it. Take it as a good thing. Because that means that you are effective in the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Another thing we need to understand, our enemies are not people. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. As bad as the government of Nigeria is, it is not your enemy. Those preachers out there who are preaching a false gospel, they are not your enemy. Your enemy is not flesh and blood. The Bible tells us that we don't fight against flesh and blood. We fight against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world. That's our enemy. So I want to encourage you to begin to see things biblically. Understand that Satan is fighting you so that he can pre prevent you from being an instrument in God's hands. So what happened in the early church? Well, Satan was in a panic. He didn't know what to do, so he began to plan. How can I stop these people? And his plan became simple. I'm going to do two things. I'm going to divide them so that they do not have the power of the Holy Spirit. 
division if 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 unity is the atmosphere of the spirit division is the atmosphere of hell let me put it that way and so he began to find ways to divide us so think about this saints why is it that after 2000 years we have not finished the commission of Jesus. If in 50 years they reached so much of the world, how is it that in another 1,950 years we have done so little? It's because this, the strategy of the enemy was effective. And I want to encourage you, we have to be willing to step out of our comfort zone and do things God's way. Okay, if we are honest, if we're honest, the church today in Nigeria and in America is pretty stoppable. The church of the book of Acts was unstoppable. We are pretty stoppable. I believe we need to look for the cause. So what we want to do in the rest of this time is to, is to say, what is the cause? Why are we so ineffective? How could they be so effective and we are not effective? Why are there, how many Christians are in Nigeria? I think it's something like 40 million professing Christians in Nigeria. Is that right? Yes. Something like that. How could 120 Christians turn the world upside down in one generation and millions of Christians in Nigeria cannot even reach the nation of Nigeria? How is that possible? We need to look at the cause. I'm going to talk about three things that I think are the cause. First of all, we don't understand our identity in Christ. You know, if you don't know who you are, you, you're going to feel weak. <clears throat> you're going to feel ineffective. So <clears throat> let's look at our identity in Christ. What does God say you are if you are saved? Now, this may be a time, I don't know the people in this room. I don't know. If everyone sitting here today is a born-again follower of Jesus. But I want us to understand that if we are, then this is who we are. All right? And if, if you are not a born-again follower of Jesus, before this day is over, I plead with you, repent and give your life to the Lord Jesus. It's the only thing that matters. <clears throat> Many Christians fail to understand their identity in Christ. They think of themselves as children of Adam trying to behave like sons of God. Can I say that again? Yes, sir. They yes, sir. think of themselves like sons of Adam. But they're trying to act like sons of God. Well, that's not who you are. You are not, if you are born of God, you are not a son of Adam. So let's see what the Bible says you are. 1 Peter 1.23 says, We are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. The word of God comes to us and it gives us new birth when we receive it and believe it. We are not born of corruptible seed. <clears throat> First Corinthians 12, 13 says, by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, and have been made to drink into one spirit. Now, we, we read these words, but do we understand them? 
by one spirit, we have been baptized. We have been plunged into the body of Christ. Think of yourself in this way. <clears throat> if Jesus were standing up here in front of you, you would, if you saw yourself spiritually, you would see yourself as inside of Jesus, as part of his body. So when God looks at you, he doesn't see Fumi or Bio or Felicia. He doesn't see you. He sees what? He sees his son, Jesus Christ. He sees Jesus. And you are hidden in Christ. You are part of him. That's how God sees you if you belong to Jesus. And he wants you to see yourself that way. That's your identity in Christ. <clears throat> it says in Colossians 1.13, we have been delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. <laughs> Think about that. You know, we're really not citizens of America or Nigeria. We live here. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are in a kingdom of God. Hallelujah. That's who we are. We've been delivered from the power of darkness. Okay. Ephesians 2, verse 5. We are seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where are you right now? Where are you right now? I am seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, in him, in him, in him. Read the book of Ephesians. The first chapter, it's all, first and second chapter, it's all about being in him, in him, in him. That's who we are. And where is Jesus? I want us to read this, Ephesians 1. This is so important. You know, God goes to a lot of trouble to make sure you know who you are. And he wants you to believe who you are in Christ. And it says, <clears throat> uh, we won't read all of this, but this is Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter 1 from verse 16 to 23. And he says, I am praying that, that God will open the eyes of your understanding, that you will be able to see who you are in Christ. And then he ends up with this. He wants you to see the greatness of God's power toward you, which he, which he worked through Christ. And then he tells us where we are. It says that we are far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named in this world and that which is to come. Saints, you are, as being in Christ, under the feet of Christ is every principality, that is every demonic force, every power, every might, Every dominion, government might, whatever might, whatever dominion, whatever power is in the world is beneath us in Christ. It's under his feet. And he gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. The fullness of him, listen to this, the fullness of him fills everything and everyone. You are living in the fullness of Christ. God wants you to believe that reality. That's who you are in Christ. And we could go on. We could spend the whole next hour just, just talking about who you are in Christ. We need to know our identity. We need to know who we are. Let's listen to this passage. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. 
Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Beloved, once you are reconciled, what do you have next? You have the ministry of reconciliation. Wow. Do you guys use the word wow in Nigeria? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Wow. You have been made ministers of reconciliation. And then he goes on to say, that is, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is who we are. We're the righteousness of God in Jesus. I just, beloved, I pray that God will open your heart and understanding to who you are in Jesus. Many people in churches who may have experienced a true birth, a new birth. They don't really know who they are. They think of themselves as not good enough. And therefore, they're willing to, to give their ministry away. Are you following me? Yes. Let pastor so-and-so do this. He, he's qualified. I am not qualified. This is a lie from the pit of hell. And it's designed by Satan to make us ineffective in the kingdom of God. Are you hearing this? Yes, sir. Know who you are. Know that you are equipped by the Holy Spirit to be a minister of reconciliation. Do not give away your ministry to somebody else. That's the plan of Satan. Okay, second, we're, we're talking about what's the cause of a weak church, okay? Why is God's church weak today? Uh, let me just pause for a minute. Stephen, are we okay on time? Is this? Yes. Yeah, we are good, sir. Okay. Yeah. You tell me when we need to. You know, in, in, in the. You have about um, 30 minutes to minister, then about 30 minutes for questions. Okay. Okay. In in the uh, in the old times when I would come to Nigeria, we used to have a timekeeper. Do you have a timekeeper? <laughs> the timekeeper would come from the back, and he would start ringing a bell, <laughs> and then I would know I have to stop. <laughs> well, let's talk about a second thing. That is a problem of wrong priorities. This is one of Satan's strategies to make you ineffective. What do we mean by wrong priorities? Well, there's evidence um, <clears throat> that making disciples among all nations is not a priority for most Christians, right? I mean, how, how many of us really think, oh, this is, this is my main job. What do you think your main job is right now? Ask yourself this question as you're sitting there. Is my main job to go to the office or to go to school? Is that my main job? If you think that way, you are already thinking along Satan's lines. Are you hearing me? We need to understand our main job is promoting the kingdom of God and making disciples. The second job is maybe going to school, going to the office, but even that job is not really your job. 
If you go to school, why are you in school? If your idea is to make money so that I will have a successful life, you know, to get a good education, then you're not thinking right. No. You're at school because that is the place where you are to be a light for the Lord Jesus. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's the place where you are to make disciples. Going to school is just part of where you are. Now, God may use that schooling to take you to the next place you're supposed to be. But when you get to the next place, then what is that? That's the place where you're going to make disciples next. Are you hearing this? But if our priority is our work or making money, I want to give you some statistics. And I know this may sound boring, but this is important. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Right? So treasure, oftentimes, we, we count that in money now, right? Naira. You know, it used to be if you had a million Naira, you could retire to UK. Now a million Naira is what you need to get through the week. <laughs> but <clears throat> anyhow. <laughs> So what what do we what do we allocate of our money to the kingdom of God? Globally, I'm going to give you the statistics, all right? Globally, Christians give approximately 2% of their income to the church or to Christian causes. Are you hearing me? 2%. Now, you may give more than that, but the average is 2% of professing Christians what they give. Of that 2%, only 6% of it, of that 2%, only 6% of that will go toward mission or to reach the unreached. So let me give it to you in, in dollars. I'll give it to you in US dollars. You can change it. If, if you were an American living comfortably you would make about a hundred thousand dollars a year. Okay. More or less, probably less, but in that range, if you made a hundred thousand dollars, you would give on average $2,000 to Christian, Christian causes. Okay. To the church, whatever of that $2,000, only $12 would go to reach the unreached. Do you hear what Jesus is saying? Where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. You know, so we have priorities. We have money priorities. What do you have? What is in your hand right now? You have some money, and you have time, and you have energy. Those are the three things you have. Money, time, energy. Where are you spending your money, your time, your energy. If it's for yourself, then you're not kingdom oriented. I, I don't want to be, I don't want to be unkind to you. Okay, uh, I'm I'm saying this because I love you. But if you're yes. spending all of your time and money and energy on yourself, you're not kingdom oriented. And this is a trap of Satan. We have wrong priorities. <clears throat> well, where does all the money go that we give to the church? Well, out of that $2,000, why does only $12 go to the unreached? You know what it goes for? It goes for the building and for the maintenance of the building and for the salaries of the people that we have given our job to. We said, okay, I'm, t I'm busy working. I'm busy going to school. So I'm going to pay you to do my job. Here, let, I'm going to give you some money to do my job. Well, that is not God's priority. A lot could be said about that. <clears throat> do you know that the church 
in the in the New Testament times didn't even have buildings. <laughs> in fact, it was 200 years before Christians ever started building their own buildings to meet in. Isn't that interesting? How much money do we spend on buildings? I think a lot. Satan's strategy is to lure us into making our priorities our physical needs. And then after whatever is left over, we give to God. Can I tell you a little story? Yes, sir. When I was a, little, a young believer, I mean really young believer, God began to try and teach me to make him my financial priority. We were poor. My wife and I were poor. We were living in the woods. In fact, we were living in, in the bush like people you think of today living in the bush somewhere in the northern part of Nigeria. We didn't have electric. We didn't have running water. We carried our water from the creek. We, we used wood to cook with. We used kerosene for light. <laughs> We needed $800 a year to live in, the, in that time. That was our goal. So we went to, to pick fruit and we worked for some time. And we, we, my wife and I, we worked together. We got, we got $800, we went home and we said, well, this is what we need to buy the food we need to live through the rest of the year. Shortly after that, we heard about a family and the, the man had been injured in an accident at work and he couldn't work and they were poor. And we heard that they didn't have food. So we went to visit them and they had four or five little children and they were living in, I don't know if you know what a trailer is. It's like a, it's like a house on wheels, but it's really small. And they were living in there. They didn't have electric light much of the time because they didn't have money. It was cold and they didn't have food. And I brought with me a, a sack of potatoes. It was about 40 kilos of potatoes. We had grown them in our garden, we had a big garden, okay, and on our farm. And I brought a sack of, of potatoes and we gave it to them and they were very happy. And we prayed with them, they were believers. And then we left, we were on our way home. And God spoke to me and said, that's not what they need. They need more. So we stopped the, the car and, and we prayed. We said, God, what should we give? And my wife was with me. And we had, we had spent $100 of the $800, okay? We had spent $100, so we had $700 left. And we prayed about it, and God spoke to us, give them that $700. Well, I was a young believer, and I believed that Jesus said, listen to me carefully. Seek, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, what? All all these things that you need will be added to you. And I had just read that passage and we had talked about it. My wife and I had talked about it. Wow, this is God's promise to us. So we said, okay, we will give that $700 and we will trust God for all the things that he provided. Now, this was an important lesson because I don't even know how we lived the rest of the year, but we, we did. God provided for us. And this was a beginning where God said, if you're a disciple, everything belongs to me. Not just a little bit. All of your money is mine. All of your possessions are mine. We'll talk about that later. What does it mean to be a disciple? But we learned that early in our life. And God was able to use that so many times. 
Do you think that God is unable to care for you? Do you think that God is unable to fulfill his promise to you? No. Well, if you believe that God is able, then live as though you believe God is able. Live that way. I would almost say live recklessly for Jesus' sake. <laughs> hey, Satan's third strategy, I believe, is division. We see divisions among Christians take away our energy. When we start fighting with each other, we don't have the strength to fight against our enemy. Amen? Are you understanding? I want you to think about an army. <laughs> Thank you, timekeeper. <laughs> okay, I want you to think about an army. If an army is not fighting it, but the army is there, just sitting in camp, these soldiers are trained for battle. That's what they're supposed to do. They want to fight. They want to fight. But if they're not fighting the enemy, you know what happens? They're just sitting in camp. They start fighting with one another. That always happens in the military. So <clears throat> that's true of Christians also. Satan understood that unity was the atmosphere of the Holy Spirit. So he began to introduce division. And one of the ways he did it was to try and change the way Jesus set up the church. Jesus set up the church so that if you were involved in ministry, that meant that you went to the bottom. You became the servant of everybody. But in the world, it's a different system. In the world, it's a different system. And that's what we read in, in Matthew chapter 20. He said, the kingdom of God isn't like the world. It will not be so among you. He said, you know, the Gentiles, they have lords over them. But if in, in the kingdom of God, it's not going to be like that. If you're going to be great in the kingdom of God, you've got to go all the way to the bottom and become a servant of everyone. But do you know what? In our culture, we like we like to have somebody to look up to. Yeah. In Nigeria, we love to have the Oga. We love to have the Oba. We love to have, oh, my pastor, woo, you should hear him. Wow. You know, and he's driving, he's driving Mercedes. Woo. And... <laughs> We have, we, we love this. You know, when I go on Facebook and I look at my Nigerian young friends, you know what I see? Yeah. Especially the girls. I see 50, 50 photos of them posing. Trying to look beautiful. <laughs> you see, it is in our fleshly nature we want to look good. We want to be at the top. But Jesus said, no, I want you to aim for the bottom. I want you to aim to be a servant. But Satan capitalized on our human nature. And he, he began to create, create divisions. <clears throat> we don't have time to go into all of this, but... <clears throat> Paul talked about this in the book of Corinthians. He said, you know, you Corinthians, you started out well, but now you're becoming carnal. You're becoming like babies. You know, you were doing fine. What happened to you? And he said, this is the evidence that I know you are babies now, that you become carnal. You are saying, oh, I'm a, I'm a follower of Paul. I'm a follower of Peter. I'm a follower of Apollos. No, you guys are all wrong. I'm the real follower of Jesus. You see what they were doing? 
they were dividing themselves over men. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing? You see, we we look at men, we say, Oh, I'm with I'm with these guys. Or we, we divide ourselves over denomination. How many denominations are in Nigeria? Thousands. <clears throat> Same thing in America. Well, if, if you are a member of this group here, let's say Pentecostal Holiness on Fire Church, okay? And this <laughs> person over here is Presbyterian. When you, when you talk to them, what are you doing? You're trying to convince them that they are wrong and that you are right. And they're trying to convince you that, that you're wrong and they're right. But if you are a, a born-again child of God, you're members of the same body. Why are we fighting each other? Why are we fighting each other? Now, I'm not saying that biblical truth is not important, but let's keep the main thing the main thing. If I am sold out to Jesus Christ and following him, and my brother over here is, I can love that person. I can be united with that person in my spirit. But if we spend our time arguing with each other, or we, or we spend our time saying, oh, you should come to our church. We have, we have the best music. <laughs> Everybody's dancing. Everybody's shouting. <laughs> you know, do you see, we don't have time, but do you see how Satan has used division to make us weak? To weaken the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe that God has a solution to all of these things, but we need to recognize where we are. Yes. I don't know if you have this thing in Nigeria like this, um, <laughs> but if you if you live in the United States and you want to go from here to there, what you do is you say, "Okay, I have this map on my phone." And I say, okay, how do I go from my house to the next town? So I put in the name of the town on my phone. And then I say, look. And I say, you show me the way here. Okay, so this is what it shows me. Can you see that? I don't know if you can see that. Yes, yes, yes. Can you see that? See that blue yes. line? Yes. Well... In order for me to get the blue line, I have to know, number one, where I am. <laughs> and then I have to know where I'm going. Yes, sir. So what God wants, if we're going to go anywhere with God, we need to start by knowing where we are. Yes. Where are we? Who are we? Know your identity in Christ. Know what is your priority in life. Know that you are united with every true child of God. And that unity is the atmosphere of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Then you look at where you're going. And you can get there. But if you don't know where you are, you don't have a map to where you're going. So, brothers and sisters, I just want to encourage you. Satan is trying to thwart the work of God. And he does it through these things. Not knowing who you are. Wrong priorities. And division. I think those are his main tools. The result is that we become spectator Christians. And for the next three minutes, I want to tell you what a spectator Christian is, okay? They're like people in a stadium. 
Do you, you guys know about football, right? Okay, everybody loves football in Nigeria. You know, I don't even know. I, I was in Nigeria one time when, when Nigeria won gold at the Olympics. Everybody was going crazy. <laughs> they couldn't talk about anything else. We were at a conference. They weren't talking about the Bible. They were talking about Nigeria football. <laughs> So a spectator is someone who is in the stands, in the stadium. And if you're a spectator, you are not on the field. Yeah. <clears throat> now, the people in the stadium, they're called fans. A fan is a short word for, nad for fanatic. You know what a fanatic is? Somebody who is crazy for their team. Yes. A fanatic is going to be there. They're going to be watching. They're going to be shouting. They're going to be cheering their team on. They're going to have the right paraphernalia. You know, they'll have the cap. Yes. I don't know the name of your football team you're following. They have the shirt. They may have the flag, you know, everything. They're up there. They're shouting. You know, they're doing everything. That's what a fan is. That is a spectator. And most Christians are spectator Christians. And Satan doesn't care <laughs> how much you shout for your team. He doesn't care if you have the right T-shirt. He doesn't care if you're carrying your Bible. You know, as long as you're a spectator, as long as you've given the work to the guys on the field, you know, you're, you're cheering for your team. Whoa, my bishop, so, 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 reverend, so, so, so. He's out there on the field. I'm cheering for him. Yay. No, you're a spectator. You're a spectator. You have been defeated by the lie of Satan. It took Satan a long time to figure out how to defeat God's people. But he has been pretty successful. If we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, God will meet us. But if we're not seeking first his kingdom, then we'll remain spectators. I'll tell you one more story. If I go over time, forgive me, okay? <laughs> um, I was at a meeting one time and a young lady came up to me and she said oh I'm going to the most wonderful church our pastor is just so great he's just wonderful and he's teaching us that everything in the Bible is positive there is nothing negative in the Bible <laughs> and I thought for a minute and I thought oh no what Bible is she reading? <laughs> but she could just not stop talking about how great her pastor was. And then at the end, she told me her, her church. Well, it's a big mega church. If I told you the name of the pastor, you would know it. Okay. What was going on with this young lady? She was a fanatic. She was a spectator. She was cheering, but she didn't know the Bible. All she knew was what she saw somebody else doing and saying. That's all she knew. Do you see how the enemy has gotten a foothold among God's people? Do you see it? Yes. So all of you in this room today, I'm counting on you to search the scriptures, see whether these things are true. And if they are, you need to walk in them. You need to live them. Okay. I'm finished. <laughs> so, all right, we... Want to have um, question time, sir? Okay. Have questions, please. You, 
You have to repeat the question, Stephen, because I can't hear them from the back, you know. Oh, all right. I'm going to do that. Questions. How many of us have questions? Have we written two? Whatever, written it down. We have questions. One. Who has again? Who has again? We have one. Two. Who has again? Number one, number two. Number three. One, two, three. All right, what's your question? Oh, number four. Where's again? Is that all? Four. Number one, number two, number three, number four. All right, so number one. Okay. Fifth all right all right number one question matthew 24 that you quoted it is asking 24 14 mm -hmm. so his question is is it when the word of god is preached all over the world that the hand is going to come Okay, it says that this gospel will be preached to all nations, and the word there is ethnos. Ethnos means a ethnic group of people. So in Nigeria, for instance, there are about 500 different ethnic groups. They have their own language. They have their own culture. If you go over to Togo, there are about 120 or so ethnic groups there that have their own language, their culture. So there needs to be a witness of Christ in every one of those groups, okay? Now, how does God do that is very important. He doesn't have to send Nigerians there. He may send a Nigerian to Togo and Togo may make, and he may make some disciples among the Togo people who will then start making disciples in their own place. Remember yeah. what we said about the church in Thessalonica? Yes. He said, you can reach those two provinces of Rome because you are disciples and you're making disciples. Okay? And so the, that church in Thessalonica went to all those places. People went there. And maybe they didn't go to every place. Maybe they went to one place. They made disciples. Maybe 10 people were discipled. And those 10 people went out to other places. But it's a chain reaction. And that's God's strategy, and it works. But yes, right. that message is going to every ethnos, every people group. Okay. Now, his question is still on the same place, but his question is, is that God's intention that they should only hear and not receive? That once they hear, the hand will come. In a word, yes. Because many people hear and don't receive. That's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to take the message there. If they reject the message, 
that's that's on them but they have the opportunity god wants every people group to have an opportunity but he also says in revelation that at around the throne of god there will be people from every kindred tongue tribe and nation so we believe that even though we may not see it god is going to provide it god is going to provide believers from every ethnic group so that's his job, but we don't have to worry about that. We just need to take the message there. <laughs> I know All, right. Yeah. all right, my question is, all right, my question is, you said that God's intention is that we make, when we have become disciples, in turn, we make disciples. Now, there is this thought that goes that the, the responsibility, just like we have members in particular, we have evangelists, we have the pastors, teachers, and all of those gifts, that the job of those who preach the gospel or make disciples is that of evangelists. That is their duty. So how do those who don't have that gift but have other gifts join in the making of disciples? Mm -hmm. That's the question. Yes. Good question. We'll talk more about that later. But I have a question for you. Okay, so you if you want to stand by and answer for me, okay? Okay. Let's say that you are a have been given the ministry of of speaking in tongues or interpretation of tongues, okay? Does that mean you don't need to pray because you have that ministry? No, sir. You have to pray? Yes, I have to pray. So what about if you what if you're an apostle? Do you have to pray even then? Yes, I have to pray. <laughs> okay. So does it matter your gifting? You need to pray, right? Everybody. Yes, sir. Okay. So what if you are a teacher by a ministry gift? Does that mean you don't need to read the Bible every, every day or read the Bible consistently? You, you don't need to read scripture? No, no. I have to read. What if you have a gift of knowledge? Do you still have to read scripture? Uh, yes, I have to read. Okay, so there are some, so everybody needs to be in the Word of God. Would you say that, everybody? Yes, everybody. Every Christian needs to be in the Scriptures, yes? Okay. Yes. What about fellowshipping? Let's say that I have the gift of, of prophecy. I have a prophetic gift. Do I need to be in fellowship with other Christians? Yes, sir. So does everybody need to be in fellowship? Is that something for every Christian is true? Like every Christian being in fellowship? Yes. yes. Is that required yes, by God? Yes, it's required. Okay. So there are some things that we're required to do. We all have to pray, regardless of our gifting. Yes? Yes, yes sir. We all have to read the word, be in the word. We all have to be in fellowship. Yes, and we yes, all sir. have to be witnesses. Yes, sir. yes. That is very clear in the Bible. That is a mandate for every Christian. Yes. So regardless of our gifting, we are called to be disciple makers. We're going to we're going to say a lot more about that. That is our priesthood in fact. We're going to talk about priesthood. Yes. And this is what this is what people don't understand. They think, okay, the evangelist is going to preach. I don't need to worry. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you know what evangelists do? We call them hit and run. <laughs> evangelists make converts, but they don't make disciples. <laughs> you know, they, they, they hit and then they run, and then you have to come behind them 
and take those people and teach them to be disciples. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Yeah, the, the last question is not a question, it's just um, a suggestion, and we have taken that. So the, the, the last question is not really a question. It's just a suggestion. OK, what is it? Um, it's about the Zoom thing. He, oh. he thought that he thought it could be subtitled. And then we've explained to him that it can't be done. OK, if you want, uh, this is going to be recorded. And somebody can yeah. come along and put subtitles and in subtitles. the recording. Yes. So maybe you can explain that for me. Yeah. All right. So we are done. No, we're not done. OK. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I have to give you a word of caution. OK. Before we go to our next session on God's solution to the enemy's tricks, we want to consider something. There's many godly men and women throughout the world who are faithfully serving God, humbly serving God. Often they are in a system that they didn't make. You know, maybe in a denomination. They didn't start the denomination. They don't know anything but what they have, what they have been grown up in. They didn't, con they didn't con contribute to the spectator mentality. They didn't have that mind. They might have been given titles by somebody. They didn't necessarily want to promote themselves. And I want us to be sure that we are not critical of other people who are, who are in a denomination, who have a title, who, who may be elevated, God doesn't look at the outside. God looks at the heart. So we, we cannot be critical of people. God's solution is going to be that we live out the truth. And when people see that, that is going to influence them. That is going to have an impact on them. We don't need to be reformers of the church system. We can't do that. It's too difficult of a job. We need to be true disciples, following Jesus, making disciples. And when people see that, they will say, wow, I want to be part of that. And I think it's important that we, that we do that. Um, there are gifted men in the body of Christ and women, and there are apostles, there are prophets, there are evangelists, there are shepherds, there are teachers. These are giftings that God gave, and the purpose that he gave them, if you look at Ephesians chapter 4, and I'm just going to read this briefly, because I think we need to, we need to not... I don't want us to believe that we're teaching against gifted people because that's not biblical. Yeah. Yeah. Ephesians chapter four names those five ministry gifts. And he says that he gave these people to the church. He didn't necessarily give the gifts to the church. He gave the people that have the gifts to the church. Okay. And so he said that he gave them for this purpose, for the equipping of the saints. So why do you have pastors and teachers and prophets and evangelists and, and apostles? They are there to equip the saints. Why? Because God doesn't want a spectator church. He wants a church where every member is equipped. Are you, are you hearing this? What are they equipped to do? It says, 
they are equipped for the work of ministry. Wow. So if, if there are in my fellowship, if there's a prophet and a teacher, those guys are going to be equipping me for the work of ministry. Are you hearing that? So those gifted people are in the church to get the other people working in the kingdom of God, to equip them for the work of ministry. And that will edify, it says, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Edifying means to build up. And it gets built up in numbers. If everyone is the disciple and the disciple maker, the church will grow in numbers. Amen? And if everyone is ministering, the church will grow in character, in Christ-likeness, in humility, in love, in unity, in strength. So this is God's plan. He gives gifted people to the church to equip you and me to serve him more completely. So let's not discount those ministries, but let's see them in a biblical perspective. These are not men to set on a pedestal. These are men who pour out their lives to equip us for the work. I, I've had people like that in my life. I've had men in my life who were humble servants of God, but they were gifted and they poured into my life and they helped me become fruitful in the kingdom of God. That's what he wants for every one of you. So now I'm finished. <laughs> can, you, can you please have a word of prayer with us, sir? Okay. <clears throat> Father, we are here before you. Lord, apart from Jesus, we are nothing. With him, we are seated in heavenly places. God, I just pray that everyone who, who hears, hears these words today will not hear me, but they will hear you. Lord, anyone who listens to this video will not see man, but they will see the Lord Jesus. That They'll be impacted by your word that your word will take root in our lives and that it will change us, will transform us into the image of your son. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that everyone in the, in the sound of this voice will be a disciple and a disciple maker in your kingdom, that you would be glorified, Amen. that your church would grow, that this world would be filled with the gospel and that Jesus will come back. Because we know that when... The work is done. We'll go home. We give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. I will see you tomorrow, God willing. Yes, sir. <laughs>